So here we go. Today we're talking about intro to orchids. And so uh, what I want to talk about really is kind of the basic care of orchids. I don't want to get too, too specific or too uh, in-depth into uh, the, the topic of orchids because it is huge. There are so many orchids out there. Um, I mean, there's, there's lots and lots of different types of varieties and species and, and classes. And so trying not to get too, too uh, convoluted into that, uh, but try and just talk about general care. Um, and this kind of works across the country. I mean, I think pretty much everywhere uh, you grow orchids, typically as houseplants, there is a couple perennial orchids, uh, ground orchids that you can grow. Uh, but really what we're going to be talking about is kind of the tropical exotic orchids. Uh, there's nothing prettier than an orchid bloom. There's so many different colors and styles and looks. Um, and they're just very, very uh, uh, cheerful, and they give you a, a, a lot of uh, excitement throughout the year, and they're just interesting and fun, and they're great collectible plants, too. So I know a lot of us uh, have, have started collecting indoor plants. I know I certainly have, um, and orchids typically scare people, and so I think a lot of people see uh, uh, orchids and say, that's got to be a hard plant to grow, but they're actually pretty easy to grow. Um, they're really not that difficult. Once you kind of understand uh, where they come from and, and what they need, um, it's pretty easy to turn your home situation into the same thing. Um, so, so I kind of start that discussion because most orchids are what they call epiphytes. And what that means is they live on other host plants. Now, they're not typically taking energy from those plants, um, but they are growing on trees or on rocks or on uh, decaying wood matter. And so what that means is uh, they, they, they typically aren't growing in soil. Now, some do, of course, uh, but a lot of times I like to explain that because it's important to know that, uh, that these plants typically are growing in a tree. And so, you know, think about the, the life of growing in a tree. And I always try and tell people, put yourself in the situation of, of where that plant naturally grows. So we're talking about tropical areas, typically good, you know, warm temperatures, high humidity. And then of course, they're not sitting in a, in a wet soil for a very long period or, or they're sitting in an area that dries very well and has good airflow. And so we're gonna talk about those uh, specifics here in a little bit uh, to kind of talk about how to emulate their natural habitat. I think that's a very important thing um, and, and that really helps kind of understand how to create that same situation in your home. Um, so let's start with general, I'm not gonna go into varieties yet, I'm gonna go into those in a little bit. I just wanna go through kind of all the general care uh, that you wanna do for your orchids. And let's start with light. I think that's probably the most common question that we always get is what kind of light do I need for my orchids? Um, and so pretty generally speaking, for pretty much all orchids, morning sun, afternoon shade is really what they want. And so in your home, that's gonna be an east facing window. Sun rises in the east, sets in the west, so the east side of your house, your east facing windows are going to be um, the, the best kind of light that you can get uh, for orchids. And they don't have to sit right in the window, but they can sit in that room where they're getting some light, what we like to call dapple light, um, and then they're getting the afternoon shade. Now, doesn't mean you can't grow uh, orchids in a, a room with a west facing window. What you would want to do is just make sure that it's not sitting directly in that in that window for sure and maybe that it's not getting hit directly for a very long period of time. So you know kind of look at your room, kind of scour the space, kind of make sure that you're watching the light throughout the day um, and, and that will kind of tell you where you can place your orchids. Uh, on a south facing room, that's a lot of light. Now there are some orchids that can take a little bit more light um, but, uh, but, and we'll talk about some of those, uh, some of them being like oncidiums and uh, cattleyas. Um, those can all take a little bit brighter light. Um, but typically speaking, orchids generally like uh, afternoon shade. And so I always bring that up too because a lot of us, and I'm gonna talk about temperature here as well, um, a lot of us will take our orchids outside for a summer vacation. And so it's good to also know the light conditions that you're taking it to outside. Uh, if you're gonna if you're gonna go through that process of taking them out during the summer and bringing them back in during uh, the fall period, uh, then 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 you want to know the light conditions. And so again, most orchids grow in trees, and so they're gonna have a canopy that is covering them. They're gonna get some bright light because they're higher up in the canopy. You know, they're growing up in the tree, uh, but they're not gonna get it all day long. 
and they're not going to get that intense overday uh, light. They're going to get it, you know, in the morning, maybe a little bit in the evening, and then dapple light throughout the day. So that hopefully helps. What I also like to point out, this is one of my favorite tips, is looking at your leaves of your orchids. So when you bring an orchid home and you watch the leaf color, if it's changing, it can tell you about your light conditions. So uh, what you want to do is, if it were just kind of investigate your plants, look at them every once in a while. And so if you see a nice healthy green color in the leaves, then you're perfectly fine. So you can see it right here. See that nice, you know, it's not a dark green, it's a rich leaf green. It's kind of that natural green color and that's what you want. If you're starting to see a lighter green color uh, where it's starting to kind of almost get bleached out a little bit on the limey green side, so if it's starting to look a little lime green, a little bleached out, too much light. So you're getting a little bit too much sunlight. You want to move it away from the window a little bit, try it a little bit further into the room, or change the room. Might be a, a, a west-facing window or a south-facing window. Um, if it is getting really, really dark green, so if you ever get a really, I see this a lot uh, when people bring their orchids in and say that they're not blooming or they're not doing really well, uh, you have a really, really dark green leaf. And so when you have a dark green leaf, that means it's not getting enough light. And you want to move it closer to the window or into another room that gets a little bit brighter light. Because a lot of us have big trees in our area. And so if you've got a tree outside that might be blocking some of the sunlight coming into the room, um, then that would be kind of a similar situation. So you might need to get it a little bit closer to that, to that window. I really think that helps. And I think that's a great tip is to just kind of always watch your plants, always kind of understand what they're going through and, and kind of sometimes they will show you and tell you what's going on with them and, and how you might improve their situation. Um, all right, so let's see. So I want to talk about some of the brighter because I know some of us have very bright rooms, sun rooms, uh, things where we got lots of windows. The cattleyas, the oncidiums, and the dendrobiums. Uh, really, the cattleyas are probably the best and the brightest light. The dendrobiums and the uh, uh, oncidiums are going to do a little bit better with brighter light, but I wouldn't say all day sunlight. Uh, and then pretty much every other orchid from there uh, really loves the morning sun afternoon shade. And so the east facing window is going to be best. So if you've got a condition like that where you get morning sun and you get a little bit of shade in the afternoon, you can definitely grow orchids. Now you can also grow orchids with grow lights. We're actually going to be doing a webinar here um, in the next couple weeks. I think it's uh, February 24th into February. Um, we're going to be doing uh, all about grow lights. So we'll specifically talk about orchids, but we'll talk about lots of other indoor plants that you can use grow lights to grow with. So check into that. Uh, if you want to grow orchids in a specific room that maybe you don't think you have enough light, tune into that webinar because I think that'll help as well. All right, let's talk about soil. Soil is another important one. So soils, we've got lots and lots of different types of soils that you can grow orchids in. You see these a lot. There's lots of them out there. Lots of different formulations. Uh, we really believe that the, the bark is the best. But, let me grab my sphagnum moss. So we've also got sphagnum moss. Um, so sphagnum moss comes in a couple different way, uh, uh, types. Don't use peat moss. So peat moss uh, is, is, is a different type of moss. It's shredded, it's fine, it holds a lot of moisture. It more emulates a soil than it does sphagnum moss. Now sphagnum moss, so you can get this, this is Better Grode's premium grade orchid moss. So you can see that right there. You can see in the package. It's a really, it's a long fibered sphagnum moss. And that's what you're going to want to use if your orchids are growing in that. So that's kind of what I always tell people is orchid growers grow in lots of different types of media. Uh, but it's either going to be bark or sphagnum moss. And what I typically tell people is keep them in that same situation. Don't change it. Uh, it will put a little bit of shock on them. You can do it. I'm not saying you can't do it. Uh, but we definitely would recommend if it's growing in sphagnum moss, keep it in sphagnum moss. If it's growing in an orchid bark, when you replant it, uh, use an orchid bark. And an orchid bark is going to be just like this. It's going to come in bags like this. You're going to feel it. It's going to feel kind of like a mulch, uh, but it's, it's an orchid bark. These are premium. These are done by Better Grow as well. Uh, really, really good mixes. So there's just straight orchid bark, which is basically just orchid bark. Then there is special orchid mix, and that comes with some perlite um, and some charcoal and then some, uh, some sphagnum moss in there as well to help hold in some moisture. And then you've got your Phalaenopsis mix, which is very similar as well. Charcoal, uh, peat moss, uh, chunky peat, and, uh, char and uh, perlite, and then bark. So you've got a couple different mixes, a couple different options for you, lots of different sizes as well. Uh, I love to have orchid bark around the house because I use it in different situations. I use it to replant orchids, but I also use it sometimes to top dress plants. 
I just think it kind of finishes off a pot. You can use decorative moss as well, but I do always like to have some orchid bark laying around because you just never know when you might need it. It's a great filler for the bottom of a container. It helps the drainage, and that's the most important thing with uh, soils for orchids is that it has good airflow. Airflow is super, super important. Think about, again, where do orchids grow? They grow in trees, and so in the tree canopy and uh, attached to the bark of a tree, it's gonna get good airflow all the way around its roots. And that's why a lot of people always ask the question, why do pots, why do orchid pots have holes in them? Like this right here, you can see that it's got all these holes and it. it's a lattice work pot. Lots and lots of different styles of these out there. Uh, there's even just a straight clay terracotta pot that has slits in the side that allow airflow into the root system of the plant helps dry it out. Uh, they don't like a lot of water. They like to absorb the moisture that they get, um, and then they like to have a drying out period. And so when we get to the watering part of this uh, webinar, we'll talk about all the different ways on how you can water. Um, but airflow is very, very important for orchids. And I'm also gonna repot an orchid. So we'll do that here in a little bit. Once I get through the general care techniques, we'll repot an orchid. But if it's planted in moss, use a long fiber sphagnum moss. It's very important to use that. Um, if, you are, um, if your orchid uh, came with sphagnum moss planted, a lot of growers grow it that way. Uh, holds on a little bit more moisture, but you gotta be careful that you don't rot it out. And so we'll talk about that when we get to the watering. Orchid bark is another great option, and most of your orchids you're gonna find are grown in an orchid bark. And so you typically will use an orchid bark when repotting. Uh, and like I said, you can go from sphagnum moss to orchid bark. You can go from orchid bark to sphagnum moss if you want to, if you find that that's a better situation for you. It's just be careful, and I'll kind of show you that when I'm repotting an orchid here in a second um, on how you can kind of go from one to the other. Um, all right, so the next thing is when to repot. Uh, so when do we repot an orchid? There's lots of different reasons to repot an orchid, um, but the most important is to give the root system a little bit more space. A lot of times, over time, the, the moss will break down, the nutrients get absorbed, it goes through the holes in the pots when you're watering, those types of things, but also the root system just expands. And so let's see if I can find a good example of an orchid here that needs to be repotted or could be repotted. So this one's a great example right here. So if you can see all these roots coming out, Again, this is completely natural. A lot of people kind of see the roots coming out of the pot or the container that it's grown in. I'll pull this out so you can actually see. So here we got the orchid pot or the, the grower's pot. It's a clear pot. Uh, you don't have to use a clear pot, uh, but a lot of orchid growers do because it helps them see the root system, helps them, uh, allows a little bit of light in there as well. Um, but when you have lots and lots of roots spilling out over the top, then it's a good sign that it can be repotted. Now, when do you not want to repot is when it's blooming. So while this one could be repotted pretty soon, I would want to wait for the blooms to end on this because again, repotting anything is going to put it through a little bit of a shock period and we don't want to disturb it while it's blooming. That's why we're growing orchids is to get the pretty blooms on them and we don't want to disturb that uh, by repotting it. So we can wait. You can always wait. You can almost always push off repotting for for a little while um, and so you don't have to do it right away. Uh, but the roots will kind of tell you if it needs to be repotted and that's a great example of it because you can see all these roots hanging out. Now that's completely natural. Um, it is fine. I can let this go. I mean, a lot of moth orchids, we're gonna talk about these specifically here in a little bit, will bloom for months. And so it might be three or four months before I get around to repotting this orchid, but that's okay. It'll be completely fine. It's just eventually we wanna pay attention to the root system um, and just make sure that we get it into a better pot. Here's a great example. So we're gonna, you know, this is a hanging orchid and it's in a hanging basket. It's got loads and loads of roots. Let's see if I can take this down and show you real quick. This is a Vanda, a type of, another type of orchid. Like I said, there's so many different types of orchids out there but just look at all those roots. So this one, of course, loves to grow um, up in the air in tree canopies. Um, and so, of course, all to grow in a home uh, the way it is. And so what you would wanna do is repot it so that you can have more moisture control around the soil. This would dry out very quickly in a home setting. So here at the garden center, the humidity is a little bit higher. Uh, we can mist it daily. That's what we do every day. We water our plants. Um, but in a home setting, you might want to repot this in another type of hanging basket so that you, the roots are in a little bit more orchid soil. All right, 
So that's kind of when you want to uh, repot. You also want to grade up slightly. I always tell everybody about this. Whenever you're doing <coughs> um, a indoor plant, you want to grade up a little bit. You never want to go from a small pot. So we don't want to go from a little pot like this to a larger pot like this. So I would never really want to plant this size orchid in this size pot. You can see how much space. We've got about three or four inches all the way around. What that causes is a lot of media, the soil media that you're growing it in, uh, to hold moisture. And there's no root system there to absorb the moisture. We don't have the same conditions as we do outside. So we don't have a lot of evaporation. We don't have a lot of sun exposure. There's not a lot of wind. And so those things that dry out soils quickly outside don't occur inside. And so we're typically not going to have a good uh, result if we're planting a small plant in a big pot. So I always say grade up slightly. That goes for pretty much any indoor grown plant and orchids are included in that. And, and as, as you're gonna find as I go through this webinar is orchids are very similar to most indoor plants. Uh, they, they really are pretty similar. Um, all right, let's see. So, and then of course, you can always replant into another plastic pot. And so for example, let's see, let me take this one. So that little tiny orchid and that little tiny grower pot right there, you can put this in a smaller, you know, a slightly larger, but smaller plastic container. Um, and then you can slip it into just another pot. So, you know, we have a great collection of pottery here at the garden center. Um, and so just something like this, just this little pot, it's basically a reservoir as well. So this is basically your saucer, um, but basically all it does is just hold a plastic pot. So I could take this orchid out, or I can take something like this, if I purchase an orchid like this, in this little uh, biodegradable pot, they all come in lots of different pots, uh, and I can just drop it in there and basically slip it in there like that, and I can grow my orchid that way. And then of course when I water, I can water it in the pot, and then it can absorb the moisture and then I pour out the excess moisture, just like a saucer. So pots without holes are very useful. You just typically aren't gonna repot right in them. Not to say that you can't, again, you can. Uh, I've seen orchids grown in glass. Then you would wanna use charcoal. So let's see, I thought I grabbed some charcoal. So charcoal is an important ingredient in absorbing uh, or, or disinfecting basically or uh, basically, I can't remember the exact word, but taking the funk out of old water. So if you've got water sitting down on the bottom of a pot, uh, if you've ever experienced like a boggy condition, swamps, you know, typically have that smell of water just kind of sitting in soil for a long time. And so what that is, is basically you, you want to clean that water and charcoal will clean it. Uh, so what happens is you put the charcoal down on the bottom of the pot. So if I were going to plant in this pot with no hole, I would put charcoal down on the bottom. So when the water sits down there, it gets cleaned as it gets absorbed back up through the soil. Now, what you got to be careful with, with any kind of container without holes, is overwatering, of course. And as I mentioned, orchids don't love having too much water. So we want to be careful about that. But it can be done, and we can help you with any of those situations if you want to try them. All right. Temperature, so temperature is the, the next most important thing to, to kind of think about. Uh, all orchids prefer to be above 65 degrees. They love it between 65 and 85, which is a great temperature for our home. That's what our, our homes typically are, right around that 70, 72 mark, 68. So 68 to 72 is perfect temperatures for orchids. They love that, that is not a problem at all. Um, so temperatures are, are, are important. Uh, a lot of time temperature helps blooming. So most orchids are gonna to wanna to go through somewhat of a dormant period. So again, think about a tropical area. When we get into the cooler season, it's gonna get lower temperatures at night. And so really with like a moth orchid, you can take it out to the garage, you can take it outside when temperatures drop down to about 60, 65 degrees. You can take it out for a couple nights, let it cool down, and then you should see a flower spike emerge if it's time for it to bloom. Talk about that in a little bit as well. Um, so temperature aids in forming new flower spikes as well. Uh, but temperature, uh, d degree temperature basically ranges from anywhere between 65 and 75, and that's kind of perfect temperatures for orchids. That's what they love to grow in. Now, of course, it, as I mentioned, taking them out for a summer vacation, uh, you know, we do get warmer here in the Hampton Roads area, and depending on where you live, uh, you might wanna be a little bit careful. But what, is, what, what we're really doing is taking orchids out for summer vacation if they're not blooming. 
If they're blooming during the summer time frame, then you can keep them inside, enjoy the blooms for sure. Uh, a lot of times orchids, when they get into a natural cycle, will bloom in the fall and, and during Christmas time. So, you know, fall into early winter, maybe even through winter, they all kind of typically get on that cycle because you're gonna go through a warm period, which is our summer time frame, and then it's gonna cool off as we get closer to fall. The days are gonna get shorter, and that's what triggers flower spikes. And we'll talk about how to feed them to also encourage that as well. So temperature is an important thing to know. Um, so the next thing is watering. Watering is obviously very important. Um, you know, watering typically is one of the causes for any kind of issues that you might be uh, seeing with orchids. Um, it could be light, light or water. It's typically the two things. But watering orchids is very similar to most indoor plants. And so what I tell people with almost every indoor plant, excluding some things like ferns or uh, different types of uh, uh, palms, um, they, they typically are gonna like um, a wet dry cycle. So water it really well, let it dry out. Again, let's think about where these grow in the tropics in trees, water when it rains and humidity get absorbed into that bark and then the orchid can drink from the bark as it needs it. Uh, orchids also do a great job of storing some moisture in their leaves so they can go through drier periods. And so this is kind of my tip for watering is to, if you, if you think you need to water, wait a day or two because it typically can take it. Um, so now, if you've been out of town or you feel like you've just kind of neglected it a little bit, um, then you might water it that day that you remember. But my favorite tip for watering is one, let the water sit for 24 hours, which kind of helps me. It always tells me, okay, I need to water. I think I'll wait till tomorrow. I'll get my water into my watering cans, let it sit for 24 hours. It helps evaporate some of those things that we put in the water to make them drinking safe. Uh, of course, if you can collect rainwater, that's the best. Rain barrels are a great option to collect rainwater. Um, and rainwater is obviously magic for any indoor plant because they don't get a lot of it um, because they're inside your home. But tap water can be used. Uh, you don't have to filter it or do anything. I just recommend sitting it for 24 hours. I think it really, really helps. Um, when we water, we wanna soak it really, really good. And so a lot of times I think problem, uh, people have problems with that orchid bark, because orchid bark is very airy. You water it, the water rushes right through. Um, you can do it that way. You can water it real quick with a watering can. The water is gonna pull out real quickly. Uh, if you're doing it in the sink, that water is gone. If you're doing it with a pot that has no holes in it, then you can let that water sit in there for a couple hours and then pour out the excess water. What'll happen is that water will absorb up back into the bark and really get sucked up in there. And then that way the bark is nice and moist and the uh, orchid can drink from it over the next uh, seven to 14 days. Seven to 14 days is typically your range for watering orchids. So really not too bad. We're talking about as little as twice a month to um, you know maybe four times a month, depending on your condition. And that's why I generally try not to give specific days uh, or weeks um, of when you would want to water indoor plants. Every home setting is different. You might be near a heat vent and it's drying out. You might have a dry home. You might have a humid home. Maybe it's near the bathroom. Maybe it's in the kitchen, which gets a little bit more humidity. So wherever you got running water, it's gonna be a little bit more humidity. If we need to increase the humidity, that is an important thing that you can do. And that's why I love just using a regular saucer. You can take a saucer, put rock in it, and then fill it up with some water and plant your, or put your pot on top of it. So I can put some rock in here, water it in, put some water in there, and then place my plant planter on top. And that's gonna create a natural humid situation around it. Uh, that really does help. As that water naturally evaporates slowly, then you get some humidity directly in that area. Of course, some people will buy humidifiers. You can do that as well. Um, but also misting is a great way of, of adding some humidity. The thing you gotta be careful with, with orchids, with misting or even watering is all orchids are going to have kind of where the leaf meets the stem. There's gonna form a little kind of cup down there. And so, I don't know if you can quite see it on this dendrobium, uh, but right down here, you're gonna find a little bit of a cup in an area that it can catch some water. And you don't want to let water sit in there for a long time. Now, in nature, it's okay. In nature, droplets of water are gonna evaporate very quickly. In the home setting, especially with some of your larger uh, moth orchids, you're gonna see that a cup gets pretty big in there. Then that water can sit in there for uh, many days and that can actually rot out a plant. So if you're misting the leaves, then make sure that any water that pulls up and collects in those natural cups that are formed by the leaves gets uh, tipped out, dumped over. So what you can do is just take your plant, 
cover up the bark, and then just tip it like that, and the water will come out. You can also use a paper towel or something to absorb the moisture out of those little cups, those little nooks and crannies that form with the leaves naturally on orchids. And so that's a pretty thing, that's a pretty easy thing that you can do, is just kind of watch water collection. But as I mentioned earlier with the roots, you also might need to miss the roots because these roots that are sitting out here are just gonna get uh, moisture out of the air. They're not in bark. And so that's typically why I tell people when, it, the, when the root system is pretty crazy, it's pretty big, it's coming out of the, pot, the top of the pot, uh, completely natural, you haven't messed up, you need to repot it because having those roots in some sort of bark in the sphagnum moss will help it get moisture. But if it's blooming, like this orchid, I can take the mister and just mist those roots down. And that root will help, or that, that mist, that, that humidity, that moisture on the root system will allow it to absorb into the, into the root system and be stored for a little while. So that way you can keep these roots nice, nice and healthy as well. Now the roots will also tell you, so if you've got roots that you can see, whether it's through a clear pot or whether they're coming out over the sides, um, the roots will also tell you how uh, much moisture or wind to water. So when you see a white root, so let's see if I can show you one. So here's a good example. So you can see these white roots coming out of the top. So this needs to be watered. If it was green or if they were a little bit plumper, so they're gonna have a green tint to them. Let's see if I can find another one that can just kind of show that to you. This will be a good example, I think. See if I can get this out. There we go. So here we go, there you can see the root system right in there. See how it's kind of got that green tint to it? So it's got a green tint, you can actually feel them, and they're, uh, that means that they've got moisture in there that you wouldn't need to water this orchid right away. As they start to go to a whiter color, then that's kind of a good sign to, to, to uh, go ahead and water. Um, you can also use a, a moisture meter, light meter. Uh, we have a great meter here at the garden center. It's a three in one. It's got a pH, a moisture, and a light meter. It's great for light uh, to tell you how your light situation is for orchids. Moisture is a little bit trickier. If you're using sphagnum moss, it'll help because sphagnum moss, it'll actually be able to read that moisture. In a bark mixture, it's a little bit harder to use the moisture meter but those are available uh, and they do work pretty well for telling you moisture. But the roots will tell you, you can also use weight. I really love to use weight as kind of a sign as to when a plant needs to be watered. You know, feel it every other day, go out and check it. If it feels like it's got some good weight to it, then it probably doesn't need to be watered. I use it all the time when I'm watering hanging baskets. You rarely will ever see me just watering a hanging basket for no reason, unless I'm just sure, oh, I missed two or three days, I need to go water it. But I usually am kind of lifting it up to see what the weight is. And so you can do that with a lot of different plants, uh, especially if you're growing in a plastic pot, but even a ceramic pot, you can tell kind of the weight on it. Okay, I can feel this one. You know, it's got some good weight to it, and I know that it's been well watered. Also, you've got a great tool right there on your hand, your finger. You can always check the soil. You can always check the growing media and see how it's doing. Uh, even a bark, uh, an orchid bark is going to be able to, uh, you're gonna be able to feel if it's dry or you're gonna be able to uh, feel it by weight as well. So use all the tools that you got uh, to, to determine what a water, but sight will really help with the root system. If you can see the roots, then that'll help kind of determine uh, how, the, how the moisture is, the moisture level is in the plant. All right, so that's kind of the watering part. Let's talk about feeding your orchids. So fertilizing your orchids, giving them a plant food is definitely recommended. Uh, so there's lots of different types out there show you a couple here that I carry. So we've got, of course, the miracle Grow Orchid Mist. So you can just mist this right on the leaves. That absorbs the nutrients right in through the leaves. That's what orchids do. They take in nutrients through the leaves and through the root system. So you can spray down the root system with, it, with this. Uh, it's a mist. It's a pretty light formula. So let's see, I think it's a, yeah, it's like a 0 0.02 all the way across the board, board. So it's nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. It's very light. You can use this whenever you water. It's very easy to do. Then we've got the Orchid uh, Bloom Booster from uh, uh, Espoma. So Espoma's organic uh, orchid fertilizer. So you can mix this. It's a cap and a gallon of water. It's super, super easy to do. Uh, and it's completely or organic. Uh, and it feeds instantly. And typically, you're going to use a liquid uh, fertilizer, plant food. 
Uh, but my favorites are Better Grow. So again, Better Grow kind of really focuses in on orchids and is specifically what they need to grow. And that's why you're gonna see the Better Grow soils, the orchid barks from Better Grow, the professional sphagnum moss from uh, Better Grow is a great option. And these are their two plant foods. Now these are a powder, and then you're gonna mix them with water. So, and what I recommend is using the Orchid Plus, so the green bag. So I always tell people get both bags because you're gonna want both bags. Use this at every watering. So again, that's gonna be every seven to 14 days typically. Depends on your home, depends on how much you need to water. But every watering you can use the Orchid Plus. And typically I'm gonna recommend doing that in the spring, summer, and fall. As we get into the winter months, you might do this every fourth watering. And the reason I use every fourth watering is because that's when you wanna use the Better Bloom. So I will use this. So let's say I just bought an orchid. Today's February, what, 3rd, 2nd? So it's early February. So I'm gonna use this probably all the way until the end of March. And then this will be what I use. So I'll use this for three waterings and then I'll use this for the fourth watering. So it's very easy to use. It's a tablespoon per gallon of water uh, or, and then you can even take that down smaller. If you're using like a small watering can, you can put just a little bit in there, mix it up. Cause if you've only got one or two orchids, you probably don't need to use a whole lot of it. It'll last you a long time. And then what you get is that every day or that every week or 14 day feed, it's a very nice formula. And the nice thing about this is it doesn't use urea, which is a common form of nitrogen. Orchids don't take up urea. So you'll see right here on the package, no urea. So this is the other one. This is the better bloom. So this is gonna have a little bit more phosphorus in it, which is gonna help it uh, get the nutrients that it needs to bloom. Um, and then as it blooms into the fall season, and then you go into winter and you're gonna water, or you're gonna use just this one with maybe this one every so often, but really just this about every four uh, watering. So every third to fourth watering, use a little bit of uh, the better grow uh, orchid food. And this is a great option. These are my two go-to favorites for orchids. This is the best stuff. Very simple, very easy to use. Just mix a little bit in with your water and then water your plant. You can also mix it in with your mister if you're misting a lot of your orchids. So liquid feeds are the best. Uh, you can use granular uh, 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 feeds, but typically what you're gonna find is with an orchid bark, those, those beads, those small granulars, are going to fall through the soil. And so what a lot of growers will do is take like a stocking, take like a, something that's mesh that will hold those beads in there, and then you can put the slow release fertilizer in there and drop it in with the plant. I don't ne necessarily re recommend that. You're, it's kind of like a, a fertilizer spike a plant food spike. I don't recommend those. In fact, I don't even sell them here at the garden center because you're feeding a specific area. You, it's hard to say that that is going to spread out very far and cover a good amount of the root system. With a liquid food, you know you're covered. You know you're getting all the root system. You can spray it on the leaves. You can spray it on the roots. And then that way you know you're covered and you're getting the nutrients to the plant that it needs. Uh, so in nature, they get them out of the air. They get them out of the, you know, coming down through the rain. Uh, inside our homes, you've got tap water, so you definitely want to use nutrients. Plus, you've got a media like sphagnum moss or orchid bark, and those nutrients can run through that soil pretty quickly, and there's not anything to replenish them. So you definitely want to use uh, a, a good plant food uh, to feed your orchids over the course of really, like I said, the spring into the fall. Um, and then typically, I let it go somewhat in the winter. Maybe I'll give it a, a feed every once in a while. So that's how you feed your orchid. All right, so then it's what type of orchid do you want? Now, I don't carry every type of orchid. There are so many types of orchids out there. There's probably, I don't know, last time I checked, it was over 10,000 different varieties. Uh, there's so many different types of orchids out there. Uh, there's lots and lots of different uh, uh, species. So like, you know, the, the most common one is gonna be your moth orchid, your phalaenopsis or your fail. So they got lots of names. So uh, moth orchid, phalaenopsis, or fail. You're going to hear those names a lot. And that is predominantly what we carry throughout the year. And the reason we do is because they're one of the easiest orchids to grow. And so if you're a beginner and you're just trying an orchid for the first time, you might consider a phalaenopsis, a moth orchid. They're pretty easy to grow. They have the same requirements that I mentioned earlier. So everything that I just kind of covered on the soil, the light, uh, the repotting, the temperature, all of that applies to pretty much every variety. Uh, but Moth orchids are one of the easiest ones. They have gorgeous blooms, lots and lots of different colors. So let's kind of show you some of these colors as we go through them. So look at this striping on this one. Absolutely love that. It's kind of got that white bloom with a raspberry stripe. Really pretty. 
lots of blooms on a long spike. You see them obviously used a lot for floral arrangements. I think when we all think of an orchid, this is what we think of is a moth orchid. You can see this one. This one's really pretty because it's on this heart shape. So we got these in for Valentine's Day. It's a great gift item, uh, but that really pretty kind of light pink, that kind of pale pink. It's got a little bit of striping inside the throat of, of the flower. Really, really pretty one. Let's see what else we got. Oh, look at this. I love this yellow. It's kind of buttery yellow. It's really, really pretty with that kind of raspberry uh, rose colored throat. Really, really nice one. And this is a pretty one because it's got three different spikes coming out of it. So we've actually got two plants and we've got four spikes. I, I apologize. So there's actually four in here. So you can see there's another one in here. So we got two plants in here with two spikes. Planting orchids in clusters and groups is a great thing, uh, especially if you've got a larger pot and you want to fill it and you don't want to use a smaller pot or multiple small pots. You can get a bigger pot and plant multiple uh, orchids in there because that like I said they all kind of really kind of thrive on the same kind of care so you can plant multiple varieties in there this is obviously a collection of moth orchids that kind of play off of a color tone so you've got this really pretty kind of fuchsia color bloom up here with the paler and then going to a white throat really kind of brings out the whole color collection this is again two orchids we've got one really big flower spike with this violet color with this fuchsia color and then we've got these two other uh, spikes that are coming out of one plant with this other one so you can see two plants in this nice size pot so it's a great way of collecting orchids growing them together um, and then typically they'll kind of get on the same pattern as well moth orchids also come with some spattering of color so you can see this one's got those blotches it looks great from both sides. You can't really tell which side is facing you, but they're a lot of fun. You can also angle the branches. So kind of with that heart shape that I showed you, here's another heart shape. Let's see if I can grab this one without knocking everything over. But you can take those stems and work them into a certain uh, uh, pattern. A lot of people use these for a waterfall effect. So you can take it as that stem grows up, you just attach it with a little bit of uh, twine or a little bit of wire or even orchid clips and you can take it and kind of take a wire you know a stronger wire stake and then you can bend that stake to have a different shape you're gonna see one the one that I chose to repot uh, is a great example of that a lot of times though naturally in my home uh, when, I, when the moth orchids are reblooming I will use just a regular bamboo stake get this one back in here just like this so you can see right in there the bamboo stake comes up it just helps it kind of keep it straight up so it doesn't fall over too much. It allows me to be able to see all the blooms real easily. Sometimes if you've got them up on a higher shelf, uh, on a bookcase or something, on the top of a bookcase, uh, you might want those blooms to kind of cascade over so they're kind of looking down at you so you can see the blooms really, really well. So they're very versatile. They're very easy to care for. Um, and it's one of the most common ones that you're going to find, of course, anywhere. Uh, here at McDonald Garden Center, we have a great collection. You might also see these blue ones. So I brought this one in uh, because um, this is what I think they call Mystique. So you can see that blue color orchid. This is not natural. And you're going to see a lot of these out there, a lot of different colors. Pretty much moth orchids come in whites, yellows, different shades of pink to fuchsia. Uh, the marble tones, those are all natural, even the stripes, uh, those are all completely natural. But if you see a blue one out there, or maybe a crazy other color, then that is a dye that they have injected into the plant. It doesn't hurt the plant, but it does change the color of the blooms. And typically they're going to do that right down here. You can, I don't know if you can see it there, but there's a little injection site right here on the stem. So as that flower spike comes up, they inject a dye into it, and it goes all the way to the blooms. And I bring that up just because if you buy a blue orchid, they're not natural, it's not gonna come back blue. And so when you get this plant to rebloom, it's going to uh, typically come back um, as a white orchid. It might have some other coloration in it, but typically you're gonna find a blue orchid's gonna be pure white when it comes back in and, and reblooms for you. So moth orchids are great. They come in lots of different sizes as well. So you can see this little tiny miniature one. They have these great leaves. I love the leaves on a moth orchid. They're just very rich kind of like the one that I showed you earlier. Let's see, this one's really pretty. So even when the plant is not in bloom, 
And I'm going to show you that when I get to my orchid that I'm going to replant. I'll show you the pruning kind of part of it as well because I know a lot of people usually have questions about that. But even when this plant isn't blooming, it's got these great, really thick, leathery leaves. Love the leaves on, on a moth orchid. Really, really pretty. So it's just a pretty plant by itself as well. You can also plant orchids with other plants. So let's see, I got this little combination here. So it's got a little moth orchid. Got a little frosty fern in there, got a little fern with some white variegation in there, and then it's got a cyclamen as well. So you can get a nice little combo pot here. This is going to bloom, the cyclamen's going to bloom, and then you've got uh, a fern in there and a, um, and a moth orchid. And all of those love very similar conditions. They're very easy to grow together. Um, so it's a great condition because morning sun, afternoon shade, all of these plants are going to love that. So you can also pair orchids with lots of other indoor plants if you want to make a combination of uh, different types of plants in one pot. You can do that with orchids as well. All right, so the next kind of uh, most common variety or ones that we carry right now, I don't have every variety as I mentioned, so I can't show you everything, uh, is the dendrobiums. So dendrobiums are pretty easy to grow. These can take a little bit more light. So this is a dendrobium. Uh, again, this one's not blooming, but I wanted to show you those, those uh, spikes of growth very common on a dendrobium. So you're going to get a taller spike of growth typically. A lot of times they'll bloom from just the top. Sometimes they'll bloom throughout the entire stalk. So you could have blooms coming out of every uh, stalk. Lots and lots of different varieties out there. And my buyer actually, we were talking earlier and she said, don't get stuck on trying to find a specific variety because it's very difficult. A lot of the growers out there that are growing orchids are buying uh, uh, cuttings or uh, uh, the, the baby orchids and they're not buying them by variety they're buying by what they can get and they'll grow them out real quick and then they'll sell them uh, to us at garden centers and, and uh, lots of other places throughout the world uh, but this is a great example of that so if you're looking for a dendrobium that blooms out of every portion of, of the stalk then just be patient keep checking we get we it's very difficult for us to find a specific variety uh, can be done but it's it is hard so a lot of dendrobiums you're going to find are going to flower right out of that top spike there uh, but these are really pretty plants again by themselves. So we've got a new little spike coming up down here out of the ground. So it'll keep on forming new clusters. Um, and this is a great orchid, really pretty and easy to grow. These can actually take a little bit more light as I mentioned earlier. So if you've got a brighter room and you're looking for another orchid that, that, that will work in that area, this is a great option. The Cattleyas are the best, really do the best with that, that amount of light. Let's see, I think I brought one in that's blooming. Here's one. So there's the dendrobium. Again, that flower spike coming right out of the top with that really pretty purple color. And these are typically gonna come in some of the, the pastel colors, so the purples and the pinks and the whites. That's what you're gonna find with dendrobiums. All right, so next is the oncidium. So oncidium, somebody was asking about uh, fragrant orchids. Um, so oncidiums are very, uh, uh, probably one of the best fragrant orchids out there. Now all flowers are gonna have a slight fragrance. You're not going to get a whole lot of fragrance out of them, but oncidiums are one of the best and one of the easiest really to grow. Um, you know, I always say moth orchids are the easiest and they probably really are because they give you lots of different signs with the leaves. You can tell how it's doing really well. Lots of roots, pretty easy to care for, but oncidiums would be my next best orchid. Very small flowers, so very, very tiny little flowers but they all come with a little fragrance to them. Kind of like a very soft gardenia, Maybe even some of them might have a cocoa fragrance a little bit, uh, but really, really fun. These grow with white blooms, yellow blooms. You can get a lot of different colors in them as well, but they're really easy and you get loads and loads of flowers on this spike that comes out. I'll show you this one as well. This one's not blooming. We tend to, you know, have a lot of orchids that moth orchids are typically always in bloom, but we have carry a lot of orchids, uh, like you'll see when I show you the lady slippers that are just about to bloom because we want you to get the most enjoyment out of the blooms. And that's typically what I'll tell people is when you're buying an orchid, look for more bloom production. I'll show you that here in a minute as well. So this is another Oncidium. This one's not blooming yet, uh, but let's see, it is a white. So this will be a white bloom as well, but you can just see, I mean, I can probably count almost 50 to 60 blooms on that, that stalk right there. So lots and lots of blooms. They last a long time. Uh, I didn't mention that with the moth orchids, but moth orchids can bloom for almost two months. In the right condition, they can bloom for a long time. So can oncidiums. They can bloom for a very, very long time. Very easy to grow. 
Uh, so oncidiums are another good one. And they can take a little bit more light too. So if you got a brighter light situation, you might consider oncidiums. Uh, let's see, did I get all of those? Yep. Uh, so then the next one would be, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to even attempt to say this name. I think it's Papu Petalum, which is your lady slippers. So lady slippers are really, really pretty orchids. Gorgeous big blooms, really nice looking. Uh, I think a lot of people that grow orchids want to grow this one uh, because it's, it's just a gorgeous bloom. It's very different. It's very kind of alien looking. What's kind of a cool fact that I just learned as I was walking in here is the little cup of the flower can actually collect a little bit of moisture and become a carnivorous plant. So actually insects that fall in there will drown and they can use the nutrients. So almost kind of a insectivorous plant. Uh, so uh, really, really cool looking orchids. Love the leaves on them, how they kind of sprawl out like that. Uh, and just that one single big bloom. And it'll keep on blooming from that site. You just keep pruning it off when it's done blooming. Uh, so that's a really pretty one. Let's see, I wanna show you the other ones too that have uh, some of the marbling in the leaves, which I love. So this is uh, another lady slipper. Of course, it's not blooming. You can see that bud forming right there. And that's why they call it the lady slipper because it's got the little slipper look to it. Uh, but really cool looking blooms. They have like a fairy, uh, uh, a hairy kind of flower spike that comes out of them. A lot of them are different colored. You can see this really dark, almost black, but dark purple to almost black stalk that comes out. And then I just love the leaf color. So you can see that kind of speckling on the leaves, really pretty. Here's another one. It's really nice, got that great speckling on the leaves. So it almost looks like a leopard plant. Uh, got all these little spots on it. And then of course the blooms are just all different and in so many different colors, usually multicolored, uh, ranging from your purples to almost blacks, dark, dark purple to white and yellows as well. So really pretty lady slippers are one of the favorites for people that maybe have a heavy hand in watering. They can actually take a little bit more water. So if you tend to water your plants a lot or you, a lot of people say, you know, I can't grow indoor plants because I just baby them too much. Lady slippers might be a good option for you because you can actually water them a little bit heavier and that is completely fine. Uh, of course, there's lots of other varieties out there as well. I don't have a lot of other ones here right now currently. Um, I, like Cattleya's, this is a Vanda. So this big one in the hanging basket behind me is a Vanda as well. So Vandas are really, really pretty orchids, really different uh, coloration in their flower stalks, but loads of clusters on a, or loads of flowers on a cluster uh, of, that comes out and usually hangs a little bit. So this one's a little bit more upright that you can see here, but typically they're gonna kind of hang a little bit uh, and really nice leaf structure as well. Very easy to grow. So Vandas are pretty good. They can actually take a little bit brighter light as well. Uh, so Vandas, uh, Cattleyas, there's a lot, a lot of different varieties out there. I couldn't sit here and name them all because I don't even know that I know them all. Um, but some of these are some of our favorites. And right now, if you're looking for orchids, you're typically going to find these varieties. Uh, so let's talk about moth orchids a little bit further and I'll do the repotting as well. So we can kind of finish up with a little demonstration here so you can see um, how to repot your orchids, but also to kind of explain uh, a little bit more on, on the phalaenopsis, the moth orchids, on how they bloom. And so, as I mentioned earlier, I love to pick orchids that look like this, that have buds. I get to enjoy the entire life cycle of that bloom. Uh, but with uh, moth orchids, they're almost always gonna be blooming. But what you can look for is something like this. You've got blooms opening up down here on the bottom. So let me turn it. So I've got one, two, three, four blooms opening at the bottom but I've got one, two, three, four, five, six more blooms that still open uh, and they can last a long time. You get that right condition, the right light condition, the right humidity, all those good things going and you get all that figured out, you can have your orchids bloom for a long period of time. So let me pull out this orchid right here. This one had finished up. We rarely have orchids that uh, don't have blooms on them here in the garden center. Uh, but sometimes we do. And I wanted to grab this one because it's got a lot of different things that I can demonstrate and show you. And hopefully you can see all this from here. Uh, so the first thing I'm going to do is take off our tags just so that they're not in the way and hopefully it'll help me show you everything. We're going to replant this orchid as well because it's got some big roots that are coming out. Um, it probably could last actually probably another um, I'm probably doing this a little early, I guess just to say. It probably will last another probably six months in uh, the condition that it's in right now. Completely fine. Uh, you don't have really indoor plants love in general being root bound. 
So you really don't have to worry too much about repotting right away. It's when it gets really aggressive that you got to because it's harder to water. As I mentioned earlier, when we've got a lot of roots and a little bit of soil, a little bit of bark uh, left, it's a good idea to go ahead and repot. This one's done blooming. But what I wanna show you is I'm gonna do something that I typically probably wouldn't do because uh, a lot of people ask this question is, what if I wanna keep that spike going? I wanna hopefully keep more blooms coming. So on the very end of this uh, bloom spike that's been wrapped and trained in this hoop, so you can see that's kind of that hoop form. So as I mentioned earlier, you got lots of options there on how to train your flower stalks. But on the very, very tip, and I know you won't be able to see it, there is a little tiny bud. And so that could actually form another bloom. So I could leave it on there. For this demonstration, I'm gonna show that you can take it off. So what you wanna do is prune it back. But you can prune it back to an option or to a point where you might be able to get another set of blooms out of that stalk. We'll have to wait and see. Uh, this one, I'm not gonna do that. I'm probably gonna take it all the way off. Maybe I'll leave it on there. Uh, even though repotting it is probably gonna uh, shock it a little bit and make it uh, probably not rebloom. But I'll show you on this stalk. So I took off the orchid clips. Whenever you get orchids, you're gonna get probably some orchid clips, some ties, little pieces of bamboo. I always save all those little things. It's great to kind of have them around in case you need them in the future. I'm gonna take this hoop out gently, not to hurt the root system. So we're gonna take that side out, take this out. So this is all this is, is just a hoop. That, that's what they use to train the orchid spike, the flower spike on. So I could actually probably cut this off if I need to and use portions of it, but I might keep it as a hoop because those are kind of hard to find. And that way I can always use it later if I need to. All right, so how to prune this stalk back to get more blooms potentially out of it is a very common question. So I know you can't quite see it, so I'm gonna try and move it closer. So right there is our flower spike. So I can see where all the flowers were attached. And then I can find where there's a, basically kind of what I would call maybe a node on the stem. So these are all old flowers, where the old flowers were. You can kind of, I don't know if you can quite see, but they're kind of popped up. Then there's one that's laying flat. It's got a, got a bump to it. These are popped up, blooms have come out of here. So I'll try and show this a little bit closer when I come over to answer your questions here at the end. Uh, but I'm gonna take this back to the one that's flat. So what I can do is cut it right here. I'm gonna cut it at a 45 degree angle away from that node. Uh, and that potentially could produce more blooms for me. May, may not. You can actually tell where this one was pruned before. So it was pruned here and obviously another flower spike came out of it. So a lot of times you'll see that on flower spikes, you know, growers have lots and lots of orchids growing and sometimes they miss a shipment. So they'll go and prune it off and get another flower spike out of it. And they've got another chance of, of selling that orchid. Uh, so now let's repot it. So typically if this is done and what may happen here is as that stem. So typically I would leave this stem on, see if I get a couple more blooms out of it. Maybe I will. But as that stem starts to die back, I'll start to cut it back. I'll usually cut it back hard to that first node that a flower has not come out of, a stem has not come out of, because maybe I'll get another flower spike out of that. Uh, but if it continues to kind of turn to a gray color and become brittle, then I'll go ahead and cut it off down at the stalk. And basically what you'll do is you'll just follow that stem all the way down to the base and you'll just cut it off right there. And then you know it's a great time to repot if needed. So if your root system is pretty large. All right, so we're gonna take this pot off. This is basically just the, the pot with no holes in it with an insert. So I'm gonna take that out. And then I'm gonna pick a pot that I like. I like this one. Um, so I can see here, so this is a great opportunity now that I can see the pot uh, to tell you how, if you want to change from sphagnum moss to orchid bark. I typically are gonna recommend, if you've got sphagnum moss in there, grow it in sphagnum moss. So I probably would grow this in some sphagnum moss. But for the point, for, for the demonstration here, I'll show you how you can convert from sphagnum moss to orchid bark if you want to. Uh, orchid bark, of course, is designed to emulate a tree like orchids grow in. So as I pull this out, and you can see these roots are nice and green and plump, which means it's not in a, in a, in a stressed situation. It's not uh, very dry, which is good. You don't want to take a plant that maybe needs a watering and go and replant it then. You want to typically wait uh, until it's absorbed some moisture so it doesn't have to worry about going through that shock. And then I'm just going to ease this plastic pot off. 
I can cut it if I want to be careful, but it's nice to have an extra plastic pot. Uh, especially these clear ones, they're hard to find. So I typically will keep this. So now I've got another little pot. So I can upgrade a smaller orchid if I want to. I can take a smaller orchid, plant it in there, slip it into that pot. So I'm keeping everything uh, because I might use it in the future. All right, so this one's got this sphagnum moss in there. Again, I typically would plant it with sphagnum moss. If I'm going to use sphagnum moss, then what I would do is wet it pretty well too. It's a little bit easier to work with. So I'm gonna take it, it's dry. Let's see, I, I don't have one that's open, I don't think. Let's see if I can open this one just so I can show you kind of what it looks like. I'm not gonna use it. So that's a long fibered sphagnum moss. And it's dry, it's a little brittle, it would not be very easy to work with. So I would like to wet this down a little bit before I work with it, uh, just because it's gonna be a little bit easier to mold. In fact, you can use this, a lot of people do, to form a liner in a hanging basket. So if you've got a, a hanging basket that has an open weave to it, you can actually take sphagnum moss, Get it nice and wet and moist and then line your baskets with it. You can do it with window boxes, lots of different things. Uh, but for using it, you almost always want to get it nice and moist because it's a little bit easier to work with. But I'm going to use orchid bark with this. Now the good thing about this orchid is um, that, that sphagnum moss has a nice core to it. So it's nice and stiff in there. It's well watered so I don't have to worry about uh, watering it. At this point, I can inspect the root system and look around and see if I see any bad roots. I see one here, so I can kind of show you that. Let's see if I can find the root here. So I'll bring this around, see if you can see it. But this is a root that basically, I don't know that I call it rot. Sometimes roots just die for no reason. Uh, maybe it got dry, but this is an older one. So it's down the base, uh, but it's really brittle. It's white. There's no uh, kind of feeling of, of any kind of plumpness in the, in the root system. You can actually see where it's black on the very tip. So it's got a little black portion down at the bottom, which means it obviously rotted off or it just died of natural, you know, no, no reason really. It just didn't need it anymore. But I'm going to go and snip that one off and remove that out of there. I, wouldn't, I don't have to do that. Uh, this will actually become organic matter and be completely fine in there, but it does kind of clean it up a little bit and it's a good time to inspect for any other issues. Do I have any black roots? Do I see any issues? Now what I'll do is I will probably remove, I'm gonna remove a little bit of this sphagnum moss where I can. I don't wanna disturb the root system too, too much. I don't wanna really move it around. So a lot of times uh, we'll, we'll recommend that when uh, planting a new plant in the ground outside like a tree or a shrub. You know, taking the root system and kind of roughing it up a little bit. On an orchid, you don't necessarily need to do that. We don't need to rough it up much. So all I'm going to do here is just kind of loosen up that sphagnum moss down at the bottom. You can kind of see it starting to kind of fall apart. And I'm going to save some of this. So I'm not going to take it all out. I could try and take all the sphagnum moss out, but I don't need to. It's got a good heart in there. Uh, it's nice and firm. I don't need to loosen it up and take too, too much out. But I'm going to take a little bit out and I'm going to save it and actually mix it in with my orchid bark so that I've got a little bit of that sphagnum moss so it kind of feels like it's a little bit more um, in its original home. Again, if I were doing this with an orchid that maybe was mine, um, or if I were telling you as a, as a customer or somebody that's replanting their orchid, stick with the same growing media that it's used to. But if you want to change, it's not a bad, it's not a bad thing to do. I'm going to use this special orchid mix. This is kind of my favorite one, special orchid mix, because it really can be used for pretty much all orchids. It's got everything in it. Um, I could use a specific Phalaenopsis mix, because I know it's a fail. I know it's a, a moth orchid, so I could use that. But I want to be able to show you what this orchid mix looks like. Let me open this up. Let me get a good handful here, see if I can show you. All right, so in this orchid mix, and as I get closer, when I come around to answer your questions, I'll kind of do a little bit of a closer up. Nice chunks of orchid bark, and then we've got some charcoal in there and some nice big thick pieces of perlite, and even a couple pieces of sphagnum moss in there as well, some chunky sphagnum moss. Um, so this is a really good mix, very easy to use. I'm gonna start with just putting down a little bit of a layer. A lot of times, and, I, and you'll see this a lot when you open up these, the heavy stuff, the charcoal and the perlite, goes down to the bottom. So I should have shook this up before I used it, but I'll kind of reach down in there and grab it. Just so I'm getting a nice even mix. You're probably gonna see about two thirds of it being the bark, and then you're gonna see a little bit of perlite and charcoal in there. 
And again, the charcoal is just there to disinfect the water, kind of take uh, any of those, those bad things out of the water. All I'm doing here is just literally filling up this pot. I'm going to lose some, so be, be mindful. You're going to make a little bit of a mess when you do this. So get like a cookie sheet or a tray or something uh, because these have some big holes in it. Now I could use a different pot that maybe has smaller holes. So I didn't show you this one earlier, but this is a really nice pot. 